Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Honestly, when I was a kid, No Doubt was one of those bands I'd heard of, but I never really listened to. Their breakout album, Tragic Kingdom, came out when I was five years old, so they were a little before my time. And while some of the older kids I knew were into them, by the time I was listening to that sort of thing, Gwen Stefani had moved on to her solo career, which at the time wasn't that interesting to me, and I just sort of assumed that's what No Doubt sounded like too. A while back, though, I decided to check it out and see what I was missing, and folks, it was a revelation. Tragic Kingdom is such a good album, they do so many amazing things, and while I could probably make a pretty interesting video on basically any song off it, I think the best place to start is the one that really catapulted them into the spotlight, the feminist anthem Just a Girl. Let's take it apart. The song starts with Tom Dumont playing its signature riff, and there's a couple different ways to look at this. The first is as a chord progression. If we assume every beat represents a change in harmony, then we have a D power chord, B minor, B flat major, and an A power chord. This looks to me like two really common chord progressions smashed together. The doo-wop changes, and the Andalusian cadence. Both progressions start on 1 and end on 5, but in the middle, the doo-wop changes kind of float down in thirds, whereas the Andalusian cadence takes a more direct approach, walking down in steps. Just a Girl combines both these techniques, starting off with the same 1-6 motion from the doo-wop changes, but instead of continuing to the 4, DeMont switches to flat 6 and slides down to 5 like in the Andalusian cadence. This lets us capture that strong walk-down effect while still emphasizing the 1 chord by making the departure from it relatively weak, thus marking it as our ultimate harmonic destination. But the really interesting thing here is that the two progressions exist in different modalities. The doo-wop changes are major, while the Andalusian cadence is minor. But if we're combining them into one progression, then we have to pick a side, right? We can't be major and minor at the same time. How would that even work? Well, the fact that I'm asking means you probably already know that they did it, and it all comes down to the way DeMont structures the riff. You see, when determining the modality, the first thing you want to look for is the third of the scale, which is what's called the primary modal note. This note defines the quality of the one chord, which is what determines whether we're in major or minor. But if we look at the riff again... Do you notice something missing? Yeah, there's no third. He starts off by playing the one chord as a power chord, which is just the root and fifth, meaning it has no apparent quality. He also ends on a power chord, establishing that as his primary chord shape, but in the middle, things get tricky. If you played them all as power chords, it'd sound like this. But then he'd have to use either F or F sharp, which would give us a third to work with, so instead he switches to playing the root and third of the chord in order to hide the third of the key. Normally, this wouldn't be a problem. If the primary modal note fails us, we can always fall back to the secondary modal note, which is... the sixth. Uh-oh. Much like how the third defines the quality of the one chord, the sixth defines the quality of the four chord, and since those two qualities are usually the same, we can use the sixth to help us at least guess what the third would be if we had one. Except you may have already noticed a problem. DeMont plays both major and minor sixth with roughly equal prominence, so that's not gonna do it either. So, okay, the riff can't help us, but surely some other part can. I mean, DeMont's not the only one playing notes here. Let's go to the most prominent instrument of all, Gwen Stefani's vocals. Don't you think I know exactly what where I stand. Ugh, come on, seriously? Yeah, the back half of the verse melody is mostly just Stefani alternating between F and F sharp to make absolutely certain that we can't tell which one is the real third. And look, I'm pretending to be frustrated by this for comedic effect, but honestly, I think it's really cool. The song is all about how Stefani feels cut off from participating in the world at large by her gender and the patronizing sexism she experiences because of it, and aggressively blending major and minor into one hybrid mode serves as a perfect metaphor for the sort of invisible cage she feels trapped in. Everything's good and happy, except actually it's not, you just weren't paying enough attention to notice. The other way to look at this riff, though, is to notice that for the majority of the bar, DeMont is playing either D or A, the two notes of a D power chord, so maybe this is actually not a progression at all, it's just one chord with a couple decorations thrown in. This interpretation is supported by the other instruments. Both Tony Canal's bass and Eric Stefani's synth play a couple Ds at the beginning of the bar and then lay out implying that that's all they need to establish the harmony. In this framework, we don't really have to worry as much about the modality, instead I want to focus on the part writing. DeMont's riff has two separate melodic lines running through it, each based on one of the two notes of the D power chord. The root bass line sounds like this, where we sit on D for most of the bar, then step up to E at the last second before falling back down. This part provides an anchor for the riff, constantly grounding us by reminding us where the root is, and the E at the end provides a bit of motion rising up so it can fall back down. It makes the downbeat feel a bit like a resolution where if he just played another D there... It's... incredibly boring. The fifth bass line is more melodic... 
but I think the structure is easier to see if we drop this first note down an octave. We start and end on A, and in between we go up to B, then walk back down in half steps. While the root line is mostly there to ground us, this line gives us a direction. Each statement feels like it's falling. If we just played A's here, it would, again, suck. Not quite as bad as removing the E, but still noticeably worse. But what really excites me here is the way the two lines intersect rhythmically. You might assume we just alternate between them like this, but that sounds absolutely terrible, so instead they weave them together into a more complex pattern. On the first beat, we get the root line, then the fifth, but after that they flip them around, starting each beat with a fifth line before returning to the root. This does a couple things. First, it drives home that offbeat ska feel. In ska, you tend to de-emphasize the primary beats, instead shifting the accents onto the notes in between, so that's the most logical place for our anchoring root line. Keeping it on the downbeat, though, helps ensure that we still hear it as the root, because otherwise the trick doesn't work. To balance that out and keep the offbeat emphasis, they shift the first A up an octave, making it the highest note in the riff, with the added benefit of strengthening the falling effect in the fifth line. So which of these analyses is correct? Is this a four chord loop or a decorated power chord? Yeah, no, that's not how this works. Both approaches provide valuable insight. Viewing it as a loop highlights the modal ambiguity of the riff, while viewing it as a single chord draws your attention to its melodic structure instead. If one sounds more correct to you than the other, then yeah, go with that one. Personally, I feel like the single chord version more closely reflects my experience, but my experience doesn't have to match yours, and either way, I think using both approaches is the best way for me to really understand what's going on. Anyway, they keep playing that riff through the verse, ending with this where Canal joins in to play a version of the riff without the 16th notes, adding some power in order to ramp up into the chorus. You might have noticed that this section has no D chords, so what's the deal? Did we change keys? It's hard to say. Like, maybe we're in B minor now and the chords are just sliding around the top of the scale, or maybe we're still in D but they're just not playing the one chord in order to give this section a floaty, disconnected feel. This is complicated further by the melody, which mostly sits on F-sharp, but resolves back to D at the end of each line. Personally, I'm inclined to apply a model I talked about in a previous video called hybrid tonality, where the root of the melody and the root of the harmony aren't necessarily the same root. The chords seem to be centered on B, but the melody seems like it's in D. The thing is, though, B minor and D major have what's called a relative relationship, which means they have all the same notes, they just use them differently, so the fact that they're kind of operating in different tonalities isn't immediately obvious because you can analyze either part in the other part's key. The two keys complement each other, giving us two overlapping interpretations of the same musical events. This means we have to talk about them separately, so let's start with the melody. It gives us the primary modal note in order to clearly answer the ambiguity of the verse, and then it resolves to the root to provide some closure. Pretty straightforward. We do get a bit more in the second half, where she jumps up to the fifth for decoration, which pushes her into a range where her voice goes a bit raspy to drive home her frustration, but that's about all I have to say on that point. As for the harmony, the main structure of it is this whole step slide. By making every chord transition the same, the loop de-emphasizes its key center, instead putting all four chords on roughly equal footing. There's no one place that feels like our ultimate destination. Any of these chords could be the one chord, we just default to B because it's the first one in each statement, which makes it feel more important. As you can see, each part is, on its own, pretty straightforward. It's a simple melody and a simple chord progression, but because they're secretly operating in different keys, the end result isn't quite so simple. I also want to look at the bass here because it's doing something weird. It starts by playing the root of each chord, but then jumps up to play some 16th note E's. And that's the thing, it's always E, and it's not like E is a particularly important note in either key. It's the 2 in D major and the 4 in B minor, and while the 4 is relevant in theory, it's not a major part of the actual progression being played. The closest it comes to fitting is under the A chords, where it's the 5th, but since he plays it under the B and G chords too, I think that comes off as more of a coincidence than a plan. So why is this E here? Well, honestly, I think it's here precisely because it doesn't quite fit. It adds a dissonance edge to an otherwise fairly clean chord progression, giving the section a bit more musical bite to match Stefani's sarcastic delivery. From there, we move to the post-chorus, and this is where that whole step slide really pays off because it makes the G chord feel surprisingly appropriate. If we played a normal loop like the doo-wop changes, 
and then suddenly turned around and went back to the third chord at the end, it wouldn't sound complete. That's not where the loop is pointing. It has a clear destination that it spends a bunch of time setting up, so breaking that expectation feels wrong. But if there is no destination, there's no reason we can't move down instead of up. It just works. Harmonically, the section feels like an extension of Stefani's story. She's momentarily letting loose. Up to now, all her anger has been wrapped in sarcasm and irony, but she's finally had enough, and just for a second she tells you how she's really feeling, before she suddenly regains her composure and goes back to playing the role. Likewise, instead of the smoothly falling loop in the verse or the ambiguous slide from the chorus, the band plays one of the most classic, aggressively punk progressions out there, the 1-4 vamp. Except they don't actually play it as a vamp, because after just one statement it gets cut off by a sudden return to the verse riff. It's a momentary outburst before Stefani remembers she's not allowed to be that blunt. I also want to talk about the melody though, because this is where things get a bit confusing for me. Check it out. Oh! So here's the thing, I just said that this G chord is acting as the one, and I think that's right. When I listen to the guitar, it feels like that's where it wants to settle, and the sudden D-based riff feels like an intrusion. But that's not really true in the melody. This G she's singing doesn't feel resolved to me. It feels like it wants to fall down to either F sharp or D. Why? Well, I think this is the payoff for that hybrid tonality in the chorus. The harmony shifted into a tonally ambiguous space that allowed it to exit into a new key, but the melody never left D major, and since it's been stable on that the whole time, it becomes natural to hear it in that context here too, so even though the harmony and the melody are literally playing the same note, they wind up behaving differently, at least to my ears. On the flip side, this means that the harmony has this sudden jolt back to the original key, while the melody gets to just gracefully glide in for a landing. It's a really cool effect. But maybe I'm overcomplicating things, I get accused of that a lot. And sure, maybe it is all in D major and the chords are just 4 flat 7 1. That's a valid analysis, I'm not saying it's not. Flat 7 to 1 is a pretty common resolution, it even has its own name, the backdoor resolution, and it shows up a lot in rock music. It it wouldn't be surprising to see it here. But while that's a perfectly good label for what's happening, it just doesn't match my experience listening to the song. This... doesn't sound like a backdoor resolution to me, it sounds like an interruption, and the hybrid tonality model does a better job explaining why. And that's basically it. We go through those again, get a synth solo over the chorus progression, then end by actually looping the vamp for a bit, because Stefani's not interested in playing nice anymore. That culminates in this... where the band slows down for one last statement of the 1-4 changes before finally settling on... B? A B chord? Huh, alright, I guess I have one last thing to explain. This is, again, the one chord in the chorus harmony, and it fits with a melodic F sharp while still being different from the chord we've heard here before, so I think the way I'd view this chord is as a statement that, at the end of the song, Stefani is leaving that fragile good girl act behind and claiming her own power. She's stepping out of that ambiguous D key and staking her claim in a new tonality, one she has more control over. She's had it up to here, and she's never going back. And hey, thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.